Hello, is that uh, Martin Smith, please? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to rename your um, <coughs> uh, entry into the meeting so that we can see who you are. So, uh, Martin Smith, Horsen and Hill, yeah? Uh, yes. Okay. Chris W, is that Chris Welsh? It is, yes. Okay, I'll just rename you as well. Okay. Chris, do you want to try and share your presentation just so we can check it's going to work? Yeah, I'll just load it up. Is that working? Yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, you could you could put it um, in uh, you know show presentation mode, I think, which make it a bit bigger. Yeah, fine. I'll um, oh. I'll open the PDF. I'll, uh, okay. 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 I'll but what I'll, I'll I'll load up the uh, PowerPoint presentation, and then I can do it as a um, full screen. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. So that that's pretty straightforward.
Okay, so good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to our second meeting of our scrutiny panel on regrow, rewild, and recycle. Um, so, first of all, um, I'll start off and just ask if there's any um, is there any apologies for absence? I don't believe there is. I think we've got a full compliment. Um, um, Councilor Konzar is um, joining us. Um, virtually tonight, but we've got a we've got a full a full complement at our hybrid meeting tonight, so that's good. And we haven't got any substitutions either. Um, so I'll just ask first with if there's any urgent matters. I have not been notified of any, um, and also matters to be considered in private. Um, again, I have not been notified of any, so that's fine. And um, looking at declarations of interest. Um, I know it's going to be, it's, it's one of the items on the agenda is to look at uh, the declarations of interest, but um, up, beyond what's on the agenda, which we're going to discuss anyway, I don't know if anyone's got anything else they want to bring up at this stage. Uh, but okay, I think that's fine. I think that's okay. So first of all, of all, then we'll just look at the minutes of the last meeting. And if anyone's got any points they want to make on the minutes there. So we've got, um, I've got page one. Page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, and page nine. I think anything came up there. Incredible, we have. It wasn't a very long meeting, but we still we managed to have a very long set of minutes. So um, I think we obviously got an awful lot done, which is good to know. Right then, so next one we'll go on to then is um, item six on the agenda, our panel operations. So go on to that and in our pack, that starts on page 13 of our pack. So, so first of all, um, we are asked to look at um, a co-option. Um, I mean, we're, you know, we're obviously very much, it's very much uh, fond, very fond of the Ealing Parks Foundation, and it was good to have representation from the Ealing Parks Foundation. And we have got, um, we did have something that was actually mentioned at the last meeting. Um, um, that, sorry. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, Mr. Paul Carter um, is um, is from the Ealing Parks Foundation. It was, and it was, and it was questioned whether or not there was actually a, a conflict of interest there. But the fact that um, that um, he's part of the foundation, which is here as an expert witness as well as a member of the panel, and it's something that I have actually looked into and um, brought the issue up with the Democratic Services, and and, it, and I think it's been accepted the situation that we're that we're happy with it here. Um, unless anyone else wants to raise any further points on that one, I think that we're happy with the situation as it is. Um, that no one else is raising any further points. So, Councillor Taylor. No, I won't raise any further points. So I'm satisfied with the explanation. Thank you very much. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So in that case, um, yes. So so we'll be looking to to have um, Mr. Carter as a permanent co-optee on our panel. So is that agreed? Lovely. Thank you. That's good. So that's the one point there sorted out. So I think um, the other part we need wanted to look at was um, approving the agenda items and actions for the next meeting on the 19th of January 2023 and that's going to be our meeting which is going to be looking at trees and um, so there were some points that we already had stated that what we want to look at when it comes, comes to trees we've got that on page page um, 18 of our pack um, so the overall aim of that meeting was to consider the work of tree planting, maintenance, and the impacts of greening the borough. 
and, uh, and we want to invite potential expert witnesses, trees for cities and trees for streets and um, potential site visit. I know it'd be a bit colder that time of year, but we might want to look at a potential site visit, um, even if the trees are going to be a bit there as well, um, looking at local programmes and um, best practice examples elsewhere. Um, so it might be a good idea now if, if anyone's got anything more they want to uh, maybe suggest for that. OK, Councillor Crawford, please. Um, um, with regard to making our streets safer, particularly at night, I would like the whoever the officer makes the presentation is to have regard to what can be done because we're planting more trees. You know, it's looking at the canopies and the issues already when they're a bit close and 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 and, and that they're covering the light that is, you know, um, uh, the direction of light you know, and um, seeing what can be done, particularly as I, I fear with the cost, with, 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 with less funding that we're gonna have, there's going to be less ability um, to do um, the, you know, the, the three year cycle of, of pruning and whatever. So, uh, so and it's also, with that would be knowing for residents because the tree the, the the tree you know guys are very good at saying yes if you if you have a particular kind of tree uh they you know we'll consider it but it might be an idea if they just came with you know put some illustrations up of the kind of trees the ones that give you know too much canopy and those trees that perhaps could be considered to make our streets safer for people going home uh, at night. Right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. That's actually a really good point. That's something for us to think about. Uh, maybe that's going to be something that when, because we are, we have been looking at safety for women on our streets and so maybe that's a point that might, that might be quite relevant to what we've been talking about there. Um, uh, then, if, oh, Councillor Taylor, please. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, thinking about some of the big developers when they develop, you know, huge schemes, like one in Greenford, for example, is it Greenford T, I think, what they do around greening the local environment, because they're building, I mean, my own block is quite big, but they seem to put plastic trees on many years ago. But I think that notion of greenery on the estates for often thousands of residents, and, you know, what, 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 what do they put into their developments apart from just building the housing units? So it'd be quite interesting, maybe hearing from one of one of the big big developers, perhaps. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I'll agree. That's a very good idea. And um, that does actually remind me um, that um, with my previous committee in climate emergency is that one thing we looked at when it came to the recommendations um, was was looking at ensuring that we did actually plant trees in areas where there might be more vulnerable people and maybe places of deprivation because of the, the incredible benefits of trees when it comes to bringing down the temperature because of when, when in the future we've got climate change, we'll have more heat waves. And so it's something that we need to look at and make sure that there's going to be decent tree cover in order to bring down the temperature in areas where people might not be able to necessarily um, keep themselves cool in their own homes. So, um, you know, so, th so that's the kind of, so that is actually very, very relevant that we can just look at that as a kind of an idea of looking at, at planning overall when it comes to trees and where we're putting them. So, yes, I agree. Um, and it's, oh, Mr. Carter, please. So we've got very ambitious targets for increasing canopy cover. Um, which translates into a lot of a lot of trees that are going to be planted. And one of the things that we've um, we've kind of seen um, over many years is that it's quite easy to plant a tree. It's much harder to maintain it. Um, so our, our funding quite often will have two or three years worth of, of kind of maintenance associated with it. Um, but particularly with you know if we have more summers like the one that we had this year, then we open ourselves up to. Um, a lot of trees being planted, which then suffer through or die off uh, through through neglect. So I think it, it'd be really interesting to talk all not not just about the the um, the tree planting program, but also the medium to long term maintenance, which and the answer to which may may lie in passing the ownership over to local resident groups, friends groups, etc. But just something about the interaction between um, you know the the planting of the trees and their uh, then there's, and their sustainable existence, I think, would be really helpful if we can build that into into the session. Yes, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, that sounds good. So, I don't know, is there any further input on that? Because one thing we can look at as well is, as I mentioned, is maybe having a, a site visit 
Um, and so, uh, because one thing that happened on Saturday, of course, is that uh, many of us, we went out on a site visit. Um, there was one place we were meant to, to visit, um, Woolfield Allotments, um, but we didn't. And so it's actually coming to my mind if that's something that might be relevant for tree planting or if there's maybe another, another place that might be suggested that we can just look at a, a project where people are getting together, planting trees, planting generally and seeing what anything else is. Oh, Chris, please. Chair, um, may not be possible, but we can certainly look at the timetable for planting programs. Uh, I'm sure that in the period between November and February, there will be a, a tree planting event in partnership with Trees for Cities. If it is around the time of the next panel meeting, then we could actually invite uh, members of the panel to come along and plant some trees as part of a visit. Yes, that's, that sounds yes, that, 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 yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. And that really does have time with what we've already noted down there. It would just not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's just, it's just yeah. I think it's just an idea I had because it's something that we, that we were just a little bit too late in the day to get to their harvest festival at Warfield, and so we missed it. But might, maybe we'll find other opportunities to get down there and see what they do. So from, I know they're doing incredible, amazing things there as well. Okay, so that, so we've looked at that. Sorry, could I just say? Um, oh, yeah, it's just missed. It'd be yes. good as well, I think, to put an emphasis on native species of trees. I know ornamental non natives are good for a variety of things, but for biodiversity, um, they'd rely on native species they've evolved with. So I think having a target of a certain percentage, minimum percentage of new trees planted should be native species. Thank you. That was a suggestion there from um, Dr. McCormack, who's speaking to us later. So thank you. So, okay, it's, I think we've well, oh, okay, I'm sorry, Councillor Mohan, sorry. Just a quick one, Chair. Um, I don't know a lot about the uh, different types of trees, uh, but I would be interested uh, in finding out what's the criteria, like how do we decide uh, which tree is going to go where? And do we have, are we kind of uh, using enough variety at the moment or uh, is it limited? So if uh, if that can be included uh, in the report, yeah, that, that sounds that sounds really good. Yes, thank yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think that's probably we probably sure, oh, just, yes, just, just make a uh, yeah. just to make sure this happens. We have one of the most expert tree service managers working for e Ealing Council. That uh, he will absolutely answer all of those questions without without a, a, you know, a moment's hesitation. So it's important that Dale Mortimer is here. He is our tree expert. He can answer all of those, uh, tell you that we're planting minimal, non-native, 80 different tree species, et cetera, et cetera. So um, really important that Dow here, is here to present to the, to the panel. Yes, um, so we'll have to um, book Dale in um, as quickly as possible and make sure that he can make that evening. Okay, thank you. Yes, so I think in that case, I think we probably agree. I don't think there's any disagreement on those points that were made. So that's good. Um, so in that case, we'll go on to the next part of the agenda. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's um, uh, item seven, the Ealing Council Biodiversity Action Plan. So now what we've got, the format that we're going to follow here um, is that we've got um, our two council officers, Chris Bunting and Chris Walsh here, um, who are going to speak to us. And as well as that, we've got other representatives, including Dr. McCormack, who I've mentioned, and um, they've got at least one other person who's already joined us um, um, online for um, um, Martin Smith as well, who's going to be speaking to us, another expert witness. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear from our council officers and then we're going to hear from our expert witnesses and then we will leave the questions until the end. And um, the reason for that is that the officers might bring up points we want to ask questions on, but our expert witnesses may well answer those questions for us. So it might be a little bit, you know, a little bit more, a uh, little bit more tidy and efficient if we do it that way around. So in that case, if, um, uh, so, 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 right, so if, if Chris, Chris Welsh is um, happy to, to start, start us off there. So yes, welcome, Chris. Yeah. Yes, so please carry on if you're happy, if you're happy and ready. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'll just share um, my screen, which hopefully you can see that it was a document that was shared uh, earlier this afternoon. Because uh, I think it's probably appropriate to review the um, sites that we went on the visit over the weekend first. 
uh, and then um, and then we can talk about the executive summary um, of the biodiversity action plan. Keith, would you be able to advise once you can see? Yeah, we we can see it. Um, okay. If there's any way you can get rid of the thumbnails on the left, that would be good. Presentation mode, I think you need to go in. Yeah, I'm, on my screen, it is showing presentation mode. And I as it's showing um, with the thumbnails, unfortunately. Hmm. Apologies, I don't know why it's doing that. Yeah, it's it's reasonably big. Um, okay, I'll try and uh, expand it on the screen. Hang on. Okay, well, um, largely it's just a few photos from the weekend, really, and I can recap um, some of the areas. So, um, for the benefit of those that weren't able to make it. Um, on the weekends. We visited five sites. We tried to fit in six, but unfortunately time um, was against us on the day. The first site that we visited in the morning was, was North Eken Playing Fields, which seems an odd choice to go to a playing field to talk about biodiversity. But um, we met with uh, Rachel and the team of volunteers from Artification and heard about their, their overall green programs across Acton, uh, which, which go as far south as South Acton uh, Recreation Grounds, uh, and a few sites up to North Acton Playing Fields, and notably their Edible Acton three-year um, funded program, um, which has culminated in, in changes to the prior, the, the previous Bowling Green area outside the cafe in North Acton Playing Fields, where they've, they run programs and there's uh, volunteer gardening sessions on a weekly basis um, for people to um, essentially to, to connect more with nature and learn how to grow vegetables and, and meet meet residents um, and local neighbors. There, there's a quote there. I won't read it out verbatim, but there is a um, there's a quote there from Rachel Pepper. Chris, um, it's not moved on to the next slide. We're still on the on the presentation slide at the front. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so presentation mode isn't the way to go. <laughs> um, thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, sorry, back to the, the, the quote there was pulled uh, as part of a press release uh, with regards to the Edible Acton um, project, uh, where essentially it's, it's talking a lot about, um, as a result of the pandemic, particularly the pandemic, uh, and people feeling isolated in their own houses and, and and having an opportunity to meet with people and get their hands dirty essentially and reconnecting with nature um this project edible actin is is a um a, an exemplar case study um where that has proved dividends um and is one of one of a few examples across the world there are there are others but um in an area that that uh, you wouldn't probably expect it's interesting to see that type of environment on what is historically known as, as simply playing fields. So it's using our spaces to the, to the best ability that they possibly can be. Um, from there, we then went to Horsenden Hill, which I think is fair to say it probably engaged the most excitement and, and conversations out of, out of the panel on the day. Um, Martin Smith, who's joining us tonight as well, was there as well as John Staples, our park ranger for the area. Um, and showed the panel a, a small proportion of what Horsenden Hill has to offer. Um, and we, we essentially walked around the farm area um, for the 45 minutes or so that we were there to look at um, the animals that are on site now that help with not just how we are able to manage our meadows through grazing, um, but also uh, the food growing sections where uh, Mind Food, a uh, local mental health charity, um, operates. Uh, and then the, the, the sort of plethora of opportunities there are for residents and students to connect uh, with nature through um, four schools uh, and, and the events that are held there by the, the Friends of Horsenden Hill, which I'm, I'm sure Martin may, may be able to cover um, more this evening. 
We then went to Green for Trigonel, um, which which was a, a GLA funded scheme where we uh, looked to improve water quality um, and create new wetland habitats. We were met by Sue Melly, uh, who works or volunteers with the green wares, um, essentially to help clean up the river courses and keeping sites tidy through litter picking. Um, and speaking about the sort of collaborative approach with groups such as Logger Can and, and Clean Up uh, River Brent, a uh, new organization called Curb, focusing on the river, um, not just within Ealing, but also um, looking to make partnerships with Brent up, upstream as well. Um, the illustration shown here as well uh, probably shows what was difficult to, to um, emphasize on the day. Uh, on the left, you've got the existing sort of playing fields, um, which shows um, an existing ditch line and sewer line. But following the project, uh, we were able to create wetland habitats within, a, I would say, a, a disused place where, where we used to cut the grass very short. Um, was not used for sport, so we've now created new wetland habitats within that space where the dash line shows the new water flow section so it, there's natural filtration there to um, improve the health of the water as, as well as creating new wetland habitats before discharging back into the river. Uh, we then went to Warren Farm and met uh, Katie Boyles to to look at really the, the enormous scale of um, what's possible when connecting uh, meadows because there are several in, in that, that area and the many benefits um, for a variety of types of wildlife and a few illustrations there to support from their Facebook page. And then finally to off to Bixley Field Allotments where uh, Emerget and the local allotment community um, were able to showcase uh, the, the variety of um, uh, benefits to biodiversity and, and food growing. Um, we talked about how forming an association there will help the, the site um, reach its potential and, and then be able to open up more to more residents, but also look at, at school children um, visiting the site and learning more about uh, food growing and, and healthy lifestyles. And just to sort of bring it back together, a, a section that's in, in the um, executive summary um, is the vision for the Ealing Biodiversity Action Plan. Uh, and the two main points is to conserve enhanced habitats that create better and more interconnected places for wildlife cross healing, which um, with Horsenden Hill, particularly in Greenford to Grinnell and Warren Farm, you can you can see that working in action. Um, and to and, and also to increase awareness for biodiversity, encourage more people to connect with nature by doing so to take positive actions. And, and obviously that that does happen across those other sites, but that um, more um, particularly with regards to North Acton playing fields and, and Bixley and, and any allotment site really. Um, and that is really what I wanted to cover with regards to the visits from the weekend. Um, but if we then look at the pack uh, and the executive summary, I'll just tease out a few things and then, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Chris Bunting if there's anything further you'd wish to ask uh, before um, moving on to the other speakers. Um, I guess some of the key things just to tease out uh, within the executive summary is, in addition to the vision, there's two distinct um, focuses within a bio the Biodiversity Action Plan, which is, which is uh, known as HAPS and SAPS. Sounds exciting. Uh, the Habitat Action Plan, which essentially are, is, is focusing on the habitats to be created. Um, which we broke down into four specific areas, such as the built environment, parks and open spaces, wetlands and waterways and woodlands. Um, and the, the biodiversity action plan then breaks down each of those elements um, to distinct landscapes and, and sets out clear actions that, that we can do as a local authority, but also what um, residents and private landowners can also do um, with very good uh, case studies and, and tips and links and everything else um, that people can can utilize. And then the second section is is the SAPS, which is the Species Habitat Action Plan. 
So that's looking at specific species um, that are typically on, on an endangered or, or at risk uh, register. Um, and in partnership with the habitat uh, action plan, it's, it's looking at how we can improve areas within the borough to focus on those um, seven noted um, uh, species habitat action plans. And then the final page of the executive summary talks about the key actions and targets that, that we are linked with the biodiversity action plan. Um, I'll quickly run through the majority of the actions. Uh, the first one, which I know garnered some discussions uh, over the weekend, um, and I'm sure is, is something that quite a few of the councillors have, have mentioned before, but maintaining and updating local planning guidance um, to ensuring communication with planning colleagues is, is um, relevant. Um, one of the biggest risks to the environment is, is planning, is development. Um, so we, we have been engaging with our planning colleagues now that the Biodiversity Action Plan has been adopted um, to ensure that the targets that are within it um, are tried, you know, we're, we're trying as best as possible to meet to meet those targets. Um, the, the the next ones are are sort of work in action at the moment, developing and maintaining ecological network map, um, creating the Ealing Biodiversity Partnership, um, improving land management uses practices. All of these things we are currently doing um, as a team, and I think it all. I'll mention, because um, it kind of links back into planning. We, we, over the past, we as a service, over the past three, four years possibly, have been reviewing all of our sites of importance for nature conservation. So we're, we're having independent ecologists coming out and assessing all of our sites, which not only will um, inform the local plan, which is due to come out next year, um, but also provides us with with that sort of roadmap on on how best what, well one we will understand what we have, and then two how do we then um, protect it and enhance it, uh, and all these these steps will lead us down the right path to ensure that um, we are working in a, the most informed way possible, uh, and then through the Ealing Biodiversity Partnership we can work with uh, local residents. Um, organizations, even private organizations, um, to try and um, ensure that one, it's protected, but two, we can we can enhance a lot of the features uh, in, in environments um, to hit our, our sort of key action points within, within the BAP. Um, tangible targets, uh, obviously, which we want to be able to quantify um, that we've included within the BAP um, is to improve a minimum of five hectares of grassland, improve half a hectare of gardens for pollinators we've already spoken about uh, when we will go into more detail with the uh, tree canopy cover uh, to be 25 percent by 2030 and then creating new uh, wetlands and flood management projects such as uh, what's happened previously with um, green fruit to canal uh, to manage more uh, surface water by 2027 as well so it's a five-year uh, target plan essentially that have provided us with quantitative um, targets for us to, to try and achieve by that point. Um, I'll hand over to Chris Bunting if there's anything else uh, he wishes to cover before probably bringing in Sean mm -hmm. Martin at this stage. Thank you, Chris. Oh, Thank, Thank you, you for that overview. I think it's probably worth saying it was quite a long drawn out affair, the creation of the Biodiversity Action Plan. Well, I'm pleased to say it was a document that was produced by Ealing Council and not by consultants. And probably more importantly, it was, it was produced in consultation with a, a wide number of key stakeholders across the borough as well. And for me, it's important that we make sure it doesn't sit on the shelf, that actually it is reviewed year on year and action by action over the five years. And I think that's important that we recognise that and actually update that. The, the success and the achievements of the biodiversity action plan as, as we go forward. There are clearly some very ambitious pledges in the manifesto around tree canopy, new parks, growing places as well. And for me, that's, I think, a recognition of the work that's been done over the last five to six years in terms of greening, healing. 
And I think we have. I think we've achieved a huge amount of work. And it's not just me saying that. And it's hard to say, well, is this a good BAP or bad BAP or an indifferent BAP? But I just wanted to promote two things to you tonight through the chair. One of them is that there's an organisation called Parks for London, which is supported by the Mayor of London. They're a charity. Uh, and they annually assess every park service in London, all 32 of the park services. And they rank us from 1 to 32. And this year, for 2022, Ealing came joint 10th out of 32. We always want to finish top, of course, but sometimes we don't have the resources to, to get to the top. But we keep on improving, improving. But we scored the highest possible scores in the following categories. Collaboration. I think everything that Chris has mentioned in the visits are a demonstration of the collaboration that goes on with our communities and our residents. And I think we have real strength and depth in Ealing events as well and they're quite contentious often but in terms of the way events are managed promoted uh, and attract diverse audiences our parks are healthy places as well and over the years we've invested in outdoor gyms trim trails etc but probably more importantly for this this committee we scored top in supporting nature for sustainability and when we have completed our green spaces strategy we will we will get top in strategic planning as well so importantly supporting nature sustainability uh community involvement again i think we're pushing the boundaries in ealing in terms of the creation of the parks foundation but actually we have quite a, a limited number of pure what we call pure friends groups there's a whole host of other organizations and again we we started through the active citizens program in trying to engineer friends and that that proved to be very very difficult but we still we're still working on growing our network of of organizations that support the green agenda in in ealing and secondly uh again we do like an assessment and we do like external judgment uh every year we apply to the london in bloom which is an externally assessed program and for the eighth consecutive year eighth consecutive year Ealing has, has been awarded the gold, the top award for its parks in the borough. But every year beyond that, we apply for a number of conservation sites. And again, we were awarded gold for Horsenden Hill East, Horsenden Hill West, Longfield and Perivale Meadows, uh, Bolo Brook Park, Silver Gilt for Yedding Brook Meadow, and uh, a trustees award for Longfield Meadow as well. So again, there's recognition across London in terms of some of the work that we're, we're doing around our, our green agenda. So as I say, I'm delighted that we finally got a BAP adopted. It's really important that we make sure we keep on top of that and delivering that. We've had significant resources given to, given to the trees and park services to, to transform parts of Ealing in terms of canopy cover as well. And again, working with some of the organisations that are represented here tonight. Wonderful Ealing Wildlife Group with thousands and thousands of members over, over recent years. So a peak to real, a real interest. Horsenden Hill and the Friends of Horsenden Hill and the work that's going on there is an exemplar. Uh, and our re regeneration colleagues have woken up to uh, not, not wanting to... Uh, it, it used to be all about money for many, many years as we worked for austerity and looking at the commercial opportunities that were availed of us in certain locations. But actually, is a recognition that the social return on our investment and the community engagement is actually more rewarding than, than those commercial opportunities in many respects. Sometimes we can't refuse commercial opportunities because we still have significant financial challenges as well. And then the Canal and Rivers Trust and working hand in glove with the Canal and Rivers Trust on a project uh, in Southall to create a wellbeing way uh, with the award of £700,000 from the Mayor of London for green and resilient spaces uh, to transform the relationship of residents and communities with the canal and green and open spaces in Southall in order to change people's behaviours and their attitudes towards being physically active on a day-to-day -day basis and creating those hyper-local, it's a horrible term, but that's, that's what the residents of Southall are telling us. They want an intervention within 500 metres of their front door in order to find their, their exercise fix or their nature fix. And that's very much uh, a, a sort of strategy that we're working towards in Southall. So. Thank you. That's all I wanted to add. Just a sort of recognition that we've been doing this for a, for a good number of years. There's always more to do, but uh, we have some fantastic 
uh, collaborators and partners that uh, are helping us achieve so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think in these dark days, it's fantastic to have good news stories. And, you know, just a, we've got a magnificent story to tell about the success that we've had. And, and it will do so much for the residents of Ealing, the fact that we've got the green spaces that are providing so much in terms of the well-being as well. So there is um, there is added benefits there. And um, also, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who came out on, on the site visit on Saturday. It was really worthwhile just giving up our day just to get out and about and to really experience what Ealing has to offer so that we can all go back and, and continue to tell that good news story. And um, so in that case, well, um, if I can please invite um, Dr. Sean McCormack from the Ealing Wildlife Group. Uh, so you've already had some introductions, so please do carry on and, and speak to us. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I guess just for a bit of background, anyone who doesn't isn't familiar with our work, um, I set up Ealing Wildlife Group in 2016. Um, as a Facebook group to put on some bat walks um, and it's grown massively since then and we've got over 5,000 members now um, we've got quite a core group of about 100 active volunteers that get stuck in with our projects um, all over the borough we're trying to cover more of the borough than we traditionally have um, and um, personally I fit into the species action plans on um, Ealing's biodiversity action plan um, I would like to say here and I say it a lot I'm very very happy to be living in Ealing and with such a progressive council in terms of the value of green space and the value that's put on biodiversity. And I have to congratulate the parks team um, and the expertise within it on putting that value on biodiversity. Um, but our focus, obviously, as a group, we've changed from just a Facebook group into an actual community um, group. Um, and our focus is on delivering you know, meaningful change, both for people and for wildlife. Um, we operate on an ethos of three C's, which are conservation, collaboration and community. So we want to get people involved actively with what our green spaces mean for nature and for people. Um, in terms of the um, BAP, um, obviously my focus um, as kind of consultant or kind of stakeholder in that is feeding into species action plans. So as Chris said, um, the SAPs are quite separate to the HAPs, the Habitat Action Plans, and the species that we focused on were ones of national concern, but also ones of local London concern that we could have an impact with. Um, and some that were chosen that aren't on the National Biodiversity Action Plan that would have had um, really benefits in terms of public engagement. Um, and uh, most of the species that are on the, the Biodiversity Action Plan are what we term umbrella species. So whatever we do for that specific type of animal, whether it's a bird, an insect, a reptile, an amphibian or a plant, um, what we do in terms of conserving that species will have wider ranging effects for lots of other wildlife um, and people as well. Um, some of it is about habitat management, um, a lot of it is about public engagement. We've chosen charismatic species for a reason, um, to try and get the public's attention and, and get them involved. Um, what I, I would say is that it's a five-year plan, and as we've learned, a lot of our projects, um, five years, a very short time scale. So one of our success stories is bre breeding barn owls in Ealing again. Um, we don't know when they last bred in Ealing, but they're breeding again now, but it's taken us about three or four years to get barn owls breeding again, because it's to do with changing our grassland management um, to encourage their food, which is the field vole, and later on the harvest mouse, which we've reintroduced to Ealing now. Harvest mouse is not on the biodiversity action plan for Ealing, but we've chosen it because it has massive public appeal. It's a very cute little mouse, and the public really bought in and crowdfunded these mice, but they're sort of an emblem or a mascot of um, good mosaic grassland habitat that will support lots of other species as well. Um, we have ambitious plans to reintroduce not only Britain's smallest rodent, but Britain's largest rodent back to Ealing. Again, not on the Biodiversity Action Plan, but we have put in a license to reintroduce beavers. And one of the um, aims of that is really, again, public engagement, looking at nature based solutions and talking to the public about how our green spaces and intact ecosystems are of value to people. We often get asked, what's the point of a harvest mouse? Why are you introducing a new mouse? Why are you focused on protecting linnets, a little brown finch in Ealing? And our kind of remit, I guess, is to educate the public that everything is linked, everything is important. We start taking out little bits of ecosystems, the whole ecosystem collapses. So trying to get people to, to realize that, you know, street trees, urban drainage systems, um, linnets to harvest mice, to beavers, to, to grass snakes, everything is important and we have to look after it all especially in the urban um, environment, um, and also have connected um, green spaces as well. Um, so the final thing I'd just like to say is 
we're super keen to collaborate. It's in our in our kind of ethos that we want to collaborate, community um, and conservation. Um, we're already nearly past 2022 in a five year biodiversity action plan. So really, we need to kind of get moving on delivering on targets. And our focus at Ealing Wildlife Group as a volunteer group has been delivering against the BAP targets and focusing on the BAP species. But what we'd really like and what we fed into in the kind of consultancy around it is getting a list from the council on what we called shovel ready projects that we could have specked out for us. We're all volunteers. We're all lacking in time, but have shovel ready projects that we can go and apply for funding for as a community group and help to deliver, but just have some of the work done for us in terms of like, here's what we could do. Um, here's the, the kind of funding the council could give in conjunction. Um, here's the kind of areas that we could join up or could be part of this project. It's that kind of um, funding application and bigger thinking and strategy that we're lacking the resource um, to actually actually get done. Um, so yeah, we're here to help and um, we're constantly singing council's praises, but we just need um, a bit more help to really deliver against this because we've got four years left, not five. That's what I'd say. Thank you for that. And um, thank you for um, also we'd have to, yeah, remembering to give praise to our council officers as well. And I think they're doing incredible things as well. So that's great. Um, right, we've got one speaker who I don't think has actually arrived yet. Um, but so we'll move straight on to um, Martin Smith. I don't know if you'd be um, a, um, able and uh, I'm ready to speak to us. Um, he's the chair of the Friends of Horsenden Hill. He's joining us um, virtually. Are you OK to speak to us, uh, Mr. Smith? Indeed, yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Go for it. Thanks. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've worked at uh, Horsenden um, since oh, 1984 uh, as a conservation uh, volunteer, and latterly, uh, in the last 10 years of my working life as a ranger and a senior ranger at Horsenden. So Horsenden is in my blood, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing place. The interesting thing that I find with 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 nature, uh, and particularly this last two or three years with COVID, um, Mrs. Um, Smith, do, do do you mean to not have your camera on? Are you happy to have your camera off at the moment? I'm, I'm happy to have it off. That's no problem. But thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the thing that, that has amazed me in the last few years, particularly with COVID, is how how important green space has suddenly become to uh, the public at large. Uh, Horsenden Hill is a, a huge site. It's 200 acres. It's the biggest single site nature reserve in Ealing. Uh, and Horsenden Farm as part of it is relatively small, but it's an amazing little place. Um, Apart from the fact that we have animals on the site that are actually doing conservation work, uh, cows, goats, and, uh, and geese, and sometimes pigs, um, th there is a, a huge amount of other activity going on at, at the farm. Um, in particular, uh, Mind Food, who um, garden for people with mental, mental health concerns and, and worries, and the growing area, which is also managed by uh, Friends of Horsenden Hill volunteers, um, what they actually produce in the garden um, is actually sold um, at the farm or at, at the weekends, um, basically to bring income back into the farm, uh, which is invested into other projects. Um, What, what I find really interesting as well within within Horsenden is how how it has changed over the years. Um, grazing was introduced or reintroduced to Horsenden um, back in 2006 um, on some of the finest um, semi-natural neutral grassland in, in Ealing and has made a huge difference over the years in terms of um, how we manage uh, difficult green spaces. Also, in the, in the last couple of years, uh, Sean's already mentioned, 
uh, we've reintroduced harvest mice and we've changed the way that the 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 meadows are managed so that uh, we allow uh, grass to actually be left long um, at the end of the season um, to actually give cover for harvest mice. But also in the last three years, we've actually found uh, a new breeding butterfly on, on the hill, brown hair streak. It's, it's not unique to, the, to, to Ealing, but uh, it is another new, um, new species. And that says something about the the way that the site is managed um, and the way it's actually looked after. And a lot of that work is done by John Staples, who is the ranger, but also uh, quite a lot of the uh, volunteers from, from the Friends Group also get actively involved in conservation work. As as Friends, we've actually organized uh, a couple of events. We do, generally speaking, two events a year. And they've generally um, been around um, nature conservation, wildlife, and so on and so forth. One is an apple day, which we've just held. Um, we, we have a, a thriving orchard at the farm, um, and we produce um, apple juice, which we juice ourselves. Um, and it, it goes down the tree. It's, it's really impressive. But Apple Day is also uh, an opportunity for the local community to come into the farm and to, and to enjoy themselves. And this year also, we, we at fairly short notice, put on a, a, a nature festival. Um, again, incredibly successful. Uh, I think everyone who actually came along, and I would imagine that there was there were probably a couple of thousand people through the gates. Um, everyone seemed to thoroughly enjoy it, and the weather was good as well, which was important. Um, but then the income from those events, again, as I say, gets ploughed back into the farm, into activities at the uh, at the farm, um, in terms of uh, equipment. Um, and developing new spaces. Um, in the last couple of years, we, we planted a new orchard. <coughs> and we've also uh, created a, a new um, forest school area as well. Since 19, sorry, 2018, uh, 2018, we've, we've entered London in bloom um, in the It's Your Community category. And I'm pleased to say that every year that we've entered, we've actually uh, ended up in the top um, echelon of, uh, of, the, of that little competition. Um, this year, we actually ended up with 96 points out of 100, uh, which is our highest score ever. And last year, um, we received uh, a special award from the RHS for the, the consistency of the work being done at Horsenden. Um, the, the BAP is important to the borough as a whole, um, and, and particularly, I think, as, as Sean has expressed, th there is such a huge diversity of nature in Ealing um, and it is fragile. Um, th there is a lot uh, talked about uh, forming green corridors, and there are quite a lot of areas where work needs to be considered and done, I think, in terms of um, planting new trees, not just so just on the streets, but in, in areas where those trees actually start to connect green canopies and, and green um, areas together. The BAP um, originally um, was, was, was put together, I think it was 2009, um, perhaps a bit earlier than that, but, but the last BAP, um, the, the bat that I, I actually worked on um, 
was a little bit, I think, tongue in cheek. I, I don't think we had fully appreciated what uh, might be involved in, in that sort of work. But I think the, the, the back that we have in front of us um, is ambitious. It needs to be ambitious, but it's achievable. Um, and it's going to take a great deal of work. Uh, I'm, I'm getting on in years these days, and uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be around to see all the benefits of it. But um, I thoroughly endorse what, what's, uh, what's been prepared. <coughs> and uh, and we'd just like to congratulate, um, in particular, Vanessa Hampton, who, who was um, very instrumental in, in getting this put together. Uh, I think she's she's done a great job, and I'd just like to say thanks to Chris Bunting and to and to Chris Walsh for supporting it, and uh, to Sean for the amount of work that he's done on it as well. Thoroughly endorse it, and I think that's, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Dana, Mr. Smith. And so, have you got any questions from anyone to bring? Oh, Mr. Carter, please. So I've got a couple of questions, actually, but can I just start with a little story just to build on what Sean was just saying? Because um, I think there's a there's a kind of lesson which comes out of it. But one of the species which um, which the BAP's trying to encourage is hedgehogs. Um, and in South Ealing, we've got a big allotment site there and long term uh, plot holders there have told us for years and years that there have never been any hedgehogs um, there as long as as long as they can remember back. Um, one of the things that um, that's happened recently is a two week uh, trail cam um, uh, operation where we've we've put trail cams in a number of green spaces around. I say we, I mean Sean's group, um, around the borough. And we've got a few on the allotment, and um, through those trail cams, we've actually identified that hedgehogs have come back to uh, the allotment site, which is superb. Um, but the thing that that um, that occurs to me is that that also coincides with quite a change in some of the gardening practices which uh, which we've seen on the site. So with a, a big reduction in the use of chemicals, um, much more alertness to the habitats which exist um, around the site, uh, and to, to create conditions which I think have created more active conditions for the hedgehogs to want to return. So maybe this is a question for you, Sean, actually. Um, you know, do you agree that there's a there's a kind of link there between attractive um, habitats and the behaviours of the kind of residents? And it's not just applicable to allotments, but to, you know, any domestic situation. And um, on the assumption you're going to say yes to that, um, what more can we do with local residents to, to try and educate them to the fact that their behaviours have a direct impact on the very thing that we're trying to promote? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, they're absolutely interlinked and I think you can't have one without the other. I mean, if you're just talking about planting street trees and those street trees are being broken down, um, you know, or vandalized. Um, if you're talking about putting in habitat features that are going to be destroyed or trampled or, or ruined, you know, you have to get buy in from the public um, right across the borough. Um, and I think as well with the species action plans we've chosen for the BAP, we've encouraged species or we've put on species of priority that people can actively get involved with in some small way um, species that we can actually do something for on a small scale or large scale so the example would be swifts you know anyone can put up a swift box on their home and they can get this red listed bird that's had catastrophic declines breeding in their house and whole streets can get involved in our swift program and be a swift street and see these birds come back from africa every summer screaming up and down the the lane and um, raising their young and being here for three short months and going off again, not to land again on their house for three years. Those are the kind of magical kind of nature stories we need to tell people who maybe don't have a clue what a swift is or can't tell the difference between swift and a sparrow or a sparrow hawk, right? We need to actually tell good stories about nature, why it's important to us, how it's going to benefit not only our environment, but our mental well-being um, and just getting people to make small little changes and then showing them the results and showing that their tiny actions have an impact is really important because we can all get totally overwhelmed with the, the global scale of the problems we have. So I think actually using local wildlife, urban wildlife as a way to connect people and, and um, communicate with people that what they do matters is really important. 
Councillor Taylor, please. Thank you. I just want to follow that up, Sean. Um, uh, I know we've talked about developments in, the ne in an, hopefully the next meeting, but it's not from Act to live in a big block of flats, you know, and I was wondering, um, often with visits we see, being an Acton person, I don't, I, I don't see a lot of this, to be perfectly honest, but I wonder if there's work that you can do with developers, like rooftop developers. So, I mean, often they talk about allotments, you know, get people to garden projects, but it sounds like potentially it might be something else that could go on as well. Yeah, absolutely. One of the habitat action plans in the BAP is about the built environment, um, and it covers a lot of um, development and buildings and what people can do. So I did, did mean to mention it, actually. I think the BAP has to be proactive, as Chris said, with the planning department. Um, there are interventions that we can build into buildings that allow wildlife to occupy or utilize buildings as well. So swifts would be a good example of that. They nest in our buildings. Peregrine falcons nest on our buildings. Um, we've seen success there with nest box scheme at Ealing Hospital. Um, bats as well. If we have connectivity and good feeding grounds for bats, we also need them to have places to live. And traditionally that's been our buildings, but as we modernize and get better at building, we're excluding living creatures apart from us from our buildings. So actually the BAP does have um, targets to build wildlife friendly practices into the planning process and give developers a list of things that they should be doing, whether they pick you know a minimum of two out of five or two out of 10 on a list. Um, those are the kind of things I'd like to see in a kind of proactive way happening with, with the BAP. But it's it's really good for people who don't have that access to nature to learn about and see that actually, even if they don't have a green space of their own, they can do something or they can enjoy nature right on their doorstep from their balcony, from the front door. Oh, yes, please come back. Sorry, no, that no, sounds really good. It just reminded me, I think there was a rage a few years ago. I think we had so many beekeepers um, in development. Many, um, Kate and I know we had the rural beekeeper is one of our constituents that happens. <laughs> Um, but I think there are a lot of developers. I remember reading the papers pre pandemic, there seemed to be so many like beekeepers to the point where actually threatened the species, didn't they? Because uh, there were too many, but actually, sounds potential perhaps looking into something else, really. Yeah, yeah, the beekeeping thing is, is interesting because honeybees are um, one species of our 270 species of bee in the UK and they're domesticated and they're not the solution to our pollinator problems. So things like green roofs being brought in for um, built environment as well, really important to support all of the pollinators we have, bees just being a fraction of them, honeybees that we keep in hives being one of 270 species. So honeybees are not the answer. Um, but again, that's something that we could do greening our roof space. Do you think about the footprint of roof spaces in Ealing? If we started to green those, um, we'd have a huge impact in terms of carbon capture and, and um, supporting pollinators and things as well. And um, Councillor Conti, please. Um, you mentioned earlier about like different types of trees and different um, have different benefits, etc. And I guess in terms of not just on wildlife, but in terms of gardens and gardening, and in terms of what individual residents can do in their own gardens, you know, maybe they don't have an allotment, but in their private space, you know, how can they access this information in terms of what they can do in, in, in respect to maybe you know, what you're doing in part of your group, but also in terms of the council, what, what, what mechanisms are we using to try and get that information out? So, because I think people often would want to be doing things that are improving biodiversity. They maybe just don't know what the information is and they may be doing things that are wrong in their garden that actually, if they knew what the right things to do were, that they, they would maybe do it differently. Um, so I guess, where's that information accessible? How, how are we disseminating that? Um, and then just on on sort of just a slightly separate point, um, just we talked about sort of the the link and how um, the work that you guys are doing and, and and planning. I have to say, I really don't feel that that is you know that there is a linked up um, view on that because you know just even tomorrow night, you know that there's a space and metropolitan open land a tree protection order, 150 trees protected woodland that's, you know, that's, that the officers have recommended, that's coming to planning committee to, to build homes. Now, we all understand, obviously, the need for homes, but, you know, that there's a real conflict, I think, between what's trying to be achieved here uh, and then actually what, you know, actually what the planning department actually then recommend. Um, and I, I, I don't actually see there is a sort of joint up because even, you know, even the GLA says what, what's being proposed tomorrow 
is you know to an extent is wrong so i i, I you know it, it sounds like there's, there's efforts being made and communications open but whether actually that's you know being um translated into actual practice i i don't feel that actually is happening when it comes to um sort of planning related issues um to your first point the bap is meant to be a living document for anyone to read so there's sections in there of what residents can do all kinds of residents with all kinds of access to land nature green space whether it's a window box or an allotment or a garden so there's lists in there of what you can do for various species and things um the plan was always to make bite-sized chunks out of the BAP and send them out in council comms and I hope that's going to happen um and then to your third point I unfortunately agree with you that there needs to be way more connection um, between active kind of planning decisions and and consulting the BAP and having the planners and and developers looking at the BAP and using it as a living breathing document so my hand over to Chris, maybe you're one of the Chris's on that. Yeah, I echo the points around the BAP and actually we've designed into the BAP the sort of toolkits for residents in terms of how to embrace biodiversity and gardening. Uh, there's also uh, Do Something Good website that uh, has also got a number of toolkits in terms of how to engage residents in volunteering, uh, getting involved in, in groups as well. This year, we held the inaugural tree festival, Ealing Tree Festival, that took place in the summer. Uh, again, trying to educate and inform our residents in terms of the benefits of trees. We are also, and they were referenced earlier, and they will be present hopefully at the next meeting, uh, Trees for Streets. So that's a program that will be actively working with local residents in terms of tree planting not just on the highway but in gardens front gardens and back gardens as well um, we would like to see a change in attitudes around car use and car parking as well in terms of crossovers because there's a lot of denudation of of streets and no, no trees hedges hedgerows etc as well so we're quite keen to explore that further in terms of policy change um it's wife and happy well um, I won't say too much on that, but I think you're right. There is also always going to be a friction and a friction between uh, development and green spaces and trees. Um, it's fair to say that possibly we don't always have the last word in, in that engagement. There is something that we use aggressively that's called CAVAT, and that's a community, community, community valuation of the loss of a tree that we value trees and they, that value is charged to the developer uh, and that's a, a financial sum and that's about replacement of trees but clearly some developments the, the, the trees are arguably irreplaceable and the sum of money doesn't do that because you've lost generations of, of tree tree development and growth so, um, it, it's 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 London and it's always going to be a situation sitting here we're not going to solve that I think there has been a clamor for some representation from plan, planning as part of as part of this program uh, I'm not quite sure how that might manifest itself but may may well be worth exploring as part of one of the sessions uh, thank you I'm Council Hamidi please thank you um Going on what Sean said, I think what you said is true and it's interesting. It's the little things that makes a difference. And um, this is more of a suggestion. I don't recall seeing it and I'm not sure if, if it's done before, but maybe if we put something in around Ealing, that would be um, because not a lot of residents, you know, they can't go online to search. They are elderly and they have a lot of time on their hands. So um, it would be beneficial to put something in around Ealing that they can you know, just click through and get to know what what they need to do and things like that. That, that would be helpful, I think. But, yeah. Sorry, there wasn't really a question to, to answer there. So we'll go straight on to Council Crawford, please. Yeah, um, Sean, uh, thank you. Um, I just hope you um, um, encourage all your, uh, your membership to um, participate in the consultation process of the London plan. I'm, um, I'm very concerned about um, the 
smaller developments, the um, individual developments, um, the uh, amount of uh, loss of, 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 of greenery, anything, anything, it's because a lot of the, the, the side uh, rear extensions, what, what I see when I'm visiting residents, it's just been concreted over. Um, front as well, which um, um, uh, Chris Bunting just, you know, sort of talked about. And it seems like, I mean, it, it, I just can't understand why uh, um, um, the permitted development just doesn't do anything. If you're going to extend um, to the rear of your property, and there is already a garden, I, I gather the, the part of it, you know, the, 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 they have to, um, the, whoever is developing, the, the, they have to do some sort of soak away, but that's not the same. Uh, that, that it might help drainage and, you know, and uh, water going into the system. But um, I, I certainly have, have a concern and I don't know how we do it, but I hope, you know, what, we all feel about development, whether it be big or small, can be touched on in a, um, in, in a recommendation uh, for the local, for consideration for the local plan. Uh, yes, so yeah, we'll certainly take that on board because it's something that's actually that's been very important the local plan when it comes to recommendations from the previous committee on looking at the climate emergency. And I think it's something that we do need to continue with. So we do need to emphasise that point. So it's an excellent recommendation to put forward. Um, so I don't have any further. Oh, Mr. Carter, please. So um, kind of a couple of practical questions, really, probably for Chris and Chris. Um, so it's in two parts. This. So the first bit is how do we know we're on track? With the BAP, so we talked about annual reviews, but um, how, how do we interpret that, and how's that going to be done? And then, secondly, uh, given that we've a number of people have said that this is an ambitious program, that also suggests that, particularly as we as we know, we've got limited resources, we may have to make some choices in terms of you know what we go. So, I'm interested also to hear whether we've got any priorities within the plan. If, we've, if we if we find ourselves in a situation where we need to choose because we've got limited resources that we need to apply. I'll invite, okay, I'll invite Chris Welsh to answer that then, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just, just on the annual review, Paul, um, the, the intention with the biodiversity partnership, which um, we've spoken to quite a few of the consultees as part of the process, would be that um, we the, the BAP was adopted in March of, of this year. So within that, that time frame, we would provide an annual an annual update um, with a view to have the first partnership meeting um, in December in advance of the annual review. Uh, and, and possibly meet on a quarterly basis to, to begin with. Um, so it would be it would be the partnership, which involves obviously council officers, but also the organizations that were part of the consultation, um, reviewing the targets that we have, uh, but also as part of that process, I think that that's where it, it lends itself into um, the ability to prioritize um, those those projects as we move forward in the as sean says you know we've only got four years left so those initial meetings will probably cover much of that as well where um we can really start to focus down on on those key sites key habitats key species that um we can then really start to turn those projects over throughout the next four years all right thank you um so, I mean, it's actually an interesting point that came up when we were asking questions. I'm talking about around dealing because we did actually have a one or two of us had a conversation before the meeting, and it was um, you know, maybe just this talk about how do we get more information out there, and maybe around dealing would be a, a good opportunity. And one thing that when we do look at the recommendations is that one thing 
that, 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 that does come out from the site visits that we had is that a lot of organizations and a lot of these projects need a lot more publicity so that people really know what's going on as well so maybe this is something that we do need to really utilize what, whatever communications resources that we do have at the council in order to speak more about it um yeah, but um can I come in on that uh, yes yes thank you Chris. um the ground healing is is produced quarterly uh i think leisure stroke parks environment has two pages a quarter and I, we we actively use those to largely promote good work that's going on not delivered by the council but actually the collaboration and partnership there is a weekly around healing uh digital bulletin that goes out and again i'm always delighted to know how much coverage the sort of leisure and culture section is is getting in that i often count them and go that's us that's us that's a bit of us and so again i, I there's always more to be done but uh i what sean said about those bite-sized pieces i think is uh a gold dust for our comms team in terms of content um and they're limited to 10 messages a week i think in terms of the breadth of the council services but I agree. I, I do think we, we get reasonable coverage. Well, I just wanted to come back on Councillor Crawford's point about green space. And I, I'm happy to stand up and be shot down on this point. But the Council and the Park Service in particular are custodians of the green space. We uh, Our last green spaces strategy was adopted in 2012. There was one priority in, in that strategy and it was no net loss of open space in, for the lifetime of that strategy and this is where i'm prepared to be shot down but with the exception of a couple of tiny incursions into green space one of them because of hs2 uh, and another one because of a utility company i don't believe we've lost any green space that is in the ownership of the council in that 10-year window well, that is actually a really good, a really good uh, story to tell because I think sometimes we do have residents who are very concerned about these issues, and so it's good to be able to offer that kind of reassurance. And so, I'll counsel Conti, please. It was just uh, it was interesting when we mentioned the site visit on Saturday to Warren Farm. It was something I hadn't really thought about before about the conflict between trying to promote biodiversity and other potential uses for recreation on on a site. And it was, I thought it was interesting the discussion that, that we had about you know how how can residents access it especially when people don't necessarily have gardens of their own they want to maybe go and have picnics you know sunbathe whatever and obviously you know the, the talks we had about trying to promote i can't remember the name of the bird but the skylark, skylark that was it and and the type of um you know the way that they nest on the ground etc and you know potentially the, the level of protection that you need to give to that grass and i was just wondering you know, is that is that an exclusive problem to Warren Farm, or do you find that's an issue in other bits of the borough when you're trying to, you know, improve biodiversity, improve the natural habitat? Do, do you find that there there are those other those issues cropping up? Uh, they do crop up. Sometimes the council can be the architects of creating those issues. I reference. Uh, uh, events and festivals, uh, Horson and Hill in recent memory, where again, looking at finance and commercial viability of, of parks, sometimes you've got to push, push the envelope a bit uh, and actually have a balanced offer across of all of our parks and green spaces. I think it was recognised that that was probably uh, in terms of the direction of travel that Horson and Hill has, has gone on over the last 10, 10 years was a step too far. Uh, and I'm, I suppose, pleased to say that we withdrew from, from that. So we are always trying to look at a balanced offer across all of our sites, um, recognizing that some of them have some uniqueness. Uh, North Acton playing fields, as, as, as we've referenced, is a, is a playing field. It's 95, 99% sports orientated but actually we've been able to introduce uh horticulture community gardening gardening into that and we're actually looking at expanding that offer more broadly across the borough but we we do need to recognize where that could cause uh frictions and always always bear that in mind i was talking to sean before the meeting started that 
seven years ago, we used to cut our grass to a municipal disciplined level across the whole authority. Cost us an absolute fortune. One of the drivers for changing our grass management was saving money. But actually, and at that point, we 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 had to win the hearts and minds of our residents because they were suddenly seeing bowling greens turned into wild areas, uh, and there was a huge amount of resistance to that. But for a variety of of reasons, um, the changing world, we've we've probably now demonstrated the value of, of creating those biodiverse areas, pollinating corridors, etc. Um, so I think we were trailblazers in, in, in London for that and are reaping the benefits of having mature sites with that approach on, which is now starting to generate new species in, into the borough. Uh, I think we're currently riding the crest of a wave in terms of in terms of our engagement with communities and residents and community organisations in terms of that approach, um, which brings its own challenges as well. And Warren Farm is absolutely one of those. Warren Farm sports ground probably tells a tale. It was a farm once, but it's been a sports ground since 1966, I believe 67. Uh, because of, again, lack of council finances in terms of ongoing maintenance and support for that sports ground, it fell into dilapidation in 2009-10. And consequently, it's been allowed to, to rewild, um, which is a challenge, but is now presenting itself with an opportunity. And we will need to work through that through that challenge and that opportunity with local interest groups to make sure that we try to achieve the best all round solution for, for that site. And that's gonna be difficult and there will need to be elements of compromise to get to that, that happy solution. Um, but we, we do recognize the, the local interest groups and we've been working really hard with Imperial College and other landholder in, in the authority in terms of looking at how they use their land and how that can complement what's going on at Warren Farm Sports Ground. And also, Martin, still on the call, will be delighted that actually we're going through another round of recommending uh, locations for local nature reserve designations for the first time in a number of years, including Horsenden Hill and a number of meadows that are adjacent to Warren Farm. Um, so, but for me, it, it is a, providing a balanced offer across the authority. If every park and open space was devoted to, to nature, wildlife, biodiversity, then there would be uh, obviously major consequences in terms of other other issues, um, physical activity, sport, recreation being, being one of those, dog walking, et cetera. Um, but for me, Warren Farm will be about working with, with local interest groups to, to get that right and co-designing solutions about how that can work and how they can coexist. Yes, yes, I think that was something I mean, uh, I, that I was looking at when it came to Warren Farm. It was like, well, what can we really recommend for this? And so one or two, one, two of us have perhaps put forward the idea of that we need to maybe help them with their signage as to where people should be careful where they where they venture and um, so they don't disturb sky, skylarks who are nesting in the ground. Maybe we can just help with actually improvements to the peripheral um, pathway as well. Um, but then really thinking about it further, um, I'm, when it, you know, because we we don't have um, final agreements on it. But if there is, you know, if there is going to be new facilities put in there, then we do need to really work hard. Actually, as you, as you say, talking to local groups and just ensuring that we that we minimise the disturbance as much as possible. I mean, the one idea that comes to my mind is that when it comes to construction of any of, of any uh, pitches, that we perhaps ensure that we don't do it in nesting season, for example. Would that be something that might be quite helpful and beneficial? These are things that we can look at. Um, so moving on to like another point um, as well. Um, this is, could be a question that could be relevant to our officers and also Ealing Wildlife Group and to Horses and Farm. Is that one point that's come up is uh, talking about beavers um, and um, reintroducing them. And so, uh, so there are some people who, put, who will actually put forward um, another another side of that story, saying that it might not be quite as beneficial and quite as welcome as some people might feel it is. Um, for example, uh, yeah, really, um, some the beavers can be accused of, of disrupting the infrastructure in an area. For example, even 
you know, gnawing into people's trees and causing incredible damage. So, I mean, it might be helpful if, um, if those who are involved, because we are looking at maybe introducing beavers to Paradise Fields, which was a place that we didn't actually get to visit on Saturday, but we drove past and, and had, a, had like a brief look through the window. And so just to have what kind of reassurance can we offer that, um, that we're not going to end up with a situation where we're reintroducing beavers that are going to disrupt infrastructure, maybe even go into people's back gardens and create issues there. And also there are conflicting reports as to how beneficial they are to, to fish. For example, be, um, they, uh, a beaver dam might, might help deal with sediment, which um, can, can actually be good for our trout, for example, but then at the same time, um, are they actually just restricting the flow of water so that um, it can actually be quite harmful to fish? And so they're all kind of, there's a number of different issues there. I mean, what what is the truth? What is just, um, what, what is fear? What is, uh, what, is the, what is the real case and what reassurance can we give? And so, thank you. This is my favorite topic. <laughs> um, so yeah. A lot of these um, fears are common and um, kind of mislaid, I suppose. So um, the reason we are applying or the type of license we're applying for for beavers is a five year enclosure trial of beavers in an urban landscape. So we're not advocating setting beavers off down the Brent into the Thames and away to, to do what they want to do. Um, the fact of the matter is in the UK now, there's over a thousand free living beavers in the wild, some from legal reintroduction, some from illegal reintroduction, some from natural spread or escape. Um, we're applying for a trial in an urban context because no matter whether we like it or not, beavers are on the way back in the UK. They're a UK native species. Um, they're now going to be a protected species in England. Um, and they're in other cities in the UK, like um, Perth in Scotland and um, a couple of other places, towns and cities in Devon. Um, the reason for the reintroduction trial is basically to look at and experiment with and experience how we might mitigate for any of the concerns around beavers in an urban landscape, but in a very controlled way for five years. So we're planning on enclosing the entire of Paradise Fields, 10 hectare site, give the beavers lots of space away from human habitation to see what they do, what impacts they will have if they make dams, if they flood certain areas, um, how those things can be mitigated for. We already know through working with expert partners like the Beaver Trust, that some of the concerns are very, very easily managed in any landscape. So for example, if a beaver puts in a dam on a water course and um, it's flooding an area that they don't want flooded, as is happening in some parts of Scotland um, on farmland, where the beavers are going to be coming from for English reintroduction projects, um, it's very easy to put in what's called a beaver deceiver into that dam, which is basically a length of pipe with a cage around it that the beavers can't obstruct the flow in their beaver pond. And it keeps the level of that beaver pond um, at a certain maximum level. So you can determine, you can, you can basically control how much the beavers can flood a certain area on a very local level. Um, beavers will not live more than 20 meters or will not move more than 20 meters from a waterside environment. So certainly there might be stretches of the Brent that do back onto people's back gardens. And it's very, very easy if beavers did in 20 years time colonize Ealing to make certain stretches of the Brent unsavory or, or kind of difficult or um, not great for beavers, not very attractive to beavers. So there's things that we can absolutely do. And that's what we want to do. We want to learn how to live with beavers in the urban context before beavers are back with, you know, a vengeance in the urban context, basically. Um, but they're very easy animals to manage um, in that respect. In terms of protected trees, we sometimes hear, we're planting all these trees. Why would we have beavers in? Beavers chop down trees. Our trees, as um, a range of species, native species, evolved alongside beavers. It's what the rangers are out doing, managing trees, coppicing them, pollarding them. That's just the man-made way of what a beaver would do in terms of managing trees and creating structural diversity within trees and an age of trees. So beaver chops a willow to the ground, it'll sprout again, it'll provide fresh young willow that'll support loads of different species of insects than a mature willow will, and then all the birds and bats and everything else benefit from that. And then on the fish is a really interesting one. Um, we did a public consultation. We have um, quite a few hundred um, responses. Now I can't remember the exact uh, number. And we had one or two responses that said, beavers are really bad for fish. We don't want them back. They'll eat all our fish. Beavers eat, eat trees. There's a common um, confusion around otters and beavers. Um, and then there's still a concern of beavers changing rivers and streams and will they make them inhospitable to fish? Actually, our fish, salmon, trout, all of our freshwater species of fish 
evolved for millions of years alongside beavers. Um, beavers have only been gone from the UK for 400 years. Um, and actually, it's been shown several scientific studies showing that beaver will actually increase fish stocks in freshwater systems because they put more wood into the water system, which offers shelter to small fish from predators. Um, and then if we talk about the salmonids, the trout and salmon, what do we see salmon doing all the time? Jumping up weirs, jumping up obstacles. They have absolutely no problem getting upstream of beaver dams because they evolved alongside beaver dams. And in times of flood, the beaver or the water is rushing down the dam fish can get make their way up those so I totally appreciate anglers concerns and people who are interested in fish and their concerns about this new mammal coming back into man-made river systems or adjusted river systems but actually the um it's been proven that those those concerns are a bit um over the top yeah right thank you um so i don't know if uh martin smith's still there and um if he's got really any thoughts on 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 like the beavers since it's since it will be uh reintroduced in like a very similar area to where horsedon farm is um yes uh, <clears throat> i i endorse everything sean said uh, one, one of the aspects of of this particular proposal is that the area will be securely fenced um the, the Beaver Trust are quite strict about how you actually go about fencing uh, an area uh, to keep the, uh, the the beavers in. But that there will the intention is that there won't be any restriction for people to actually enter the site. Um, and, and that's part of the experiment to see how uh, people and badgers actually, uh, sorry, beavers actually interact. Um, so I, I, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Fully endorse it. <laughs> okay, so, so that's good. At least we've um, explored the subjects. So that's very good. And so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, also, I can also ask about with um, horses and farm, because one thing that did come up is that there was a lot of talk about trying to really develop it into more of a farm. Um, and um, but actually just looking at the, the house that was there and how much it might cost to um to to refurbish in order to make that fit for use. And I'm just really just thinking in terms of um what what you might do what, what you what you're involved with at the farm in terms of trying to raise money. Um, are you are you out there seeking grants for example in order to try and um, help you expand and to grow? Uh, at the moment the, the, the house project is at very early stage. Um, we, we are looking at um, possible um, means of, of funding to actually, <laughs> it sounds a bit funny, but funding to actually get funding. Um, uh, the, the, the cost of actually refurbishing the house is certainly going to be in the region of a million pounds. Um, and Friends of Horses and Farm don't actually have that sort of money. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we have got a small group uh, working now um, quite actively um, to sort of plan a way forward um, to actually see whether we can actually raise the money to actually put the house back into, into community use. Right, thank you. So that's good to know. It may be something for us to think about if we've got any pennies we need to donate. Yes, yes, yes. If you've got, if you've got a, a few pennies, that would help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Councillor Taylor, please. Yeah, Martin, so just to follow up on the last point, which, which sort of preempted the question I was going to ask, and how, how would you use that property? I mean, clearly not for, well, <coughs> accommodation, but would it be like a, um, you said community use, would it be like a training centre and... Um, what sort of things i know it's probably early days but i'm just wondering what kind of ideas you had yes in, in, in the last two uh, um events that we held at the farm we we had um the 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 chap who's actually um managing the group looking at the house um was asking uh, attendees what they would want to see uh, in, in a refurbished building and um generally speaking um the, the thing that came out on top was a cafe. Um, um, but also we're looking at things like um, a conference area. Um, we're looking at uh, <coughs> um, potentially um, uh, small studios for small businesses, startup businesses, sort of small craft shops and so on, things like that. Um, early days, but uh, 
in general, yes, very much community use rather than 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 any sort of um, uh, habitational uh, sort of occupation. That would certainly be very much welcome. Um, it's a beautiful um, place down there, right next to the canal, and there's areas for the children to play as well. So I think um, there's just there's plenty of potential there. Um, so I think um, in that case, maybe are there any other questions from anybody on any points? Or, or Dr. McCormack? Yeah, um, I've spoken with Chris and Chris about this already, but it's good to kind of put on record and put it out there. Um, I think to echo Martin's point, Vanessa Hampton was really integral in getting the BAP. Um, going and, and um, doing all the research sessions and stakeholder sessions. Um, she has now departed and um, she was head of the Rangers um, service, but um, or part Ranger manager. Um, that her role hasn't been filled. Um, we've lost another Ranger who um, was a zoologist um, by trade or by education, um, who kind of collaborated a lot with us at Ealing Wildlife Group, um, who also hasn't been replaced yet. So it would just be good. I know budgets are short I know resources are being slashed but if we lose you know keep losing um service and, and kind of um resource there and it's not replaced we probably don't stand a chance of delivering you know what we could do without with the full um suite of of park rangers and, and managers yes thank you it's a very good point um I have met Vanessa she was fantastic so so sad to have lost her um but yeah I know that there's something on other discussions that we've had outside of the meeting is looking at that we do need to ensure that that all these organizations that are being run and looked after by volunteers are are properly helped along the way by council officers where they can be and so um I think it'd be a good chance then for people to they want to bring forth any recommendations they might have based on tonight's discussion or based on maybe Saturday's um, findings that we from, from speaking to different people. Um, is there anything further? Because we've, okay, um, Mr. Carter, please. I mean, I think I made this point at the site of the last meeting, but it's uh, particularly with what Sean just said, it's kind of timely to make it again. And, and we saw that as we went around all the different sites, how much um, the real kind of benefit of, of so many of the ventures that we've got is the product of um, you know, large groups of volunteers. Um, and as the council's kind of moving from delivering outcomes to facilitating the delivery of outcomes, that interface between the council, the reducing council, should we say, uh, services and the volunteer group is absolutely pivotal to the, the delivery of, you know, all the things that we're talking about here. Um, and I wonder whether this is a question rather than a uh, bit of advocacy, but I wonder whether um, whether we've moved as an organisation um, sufficiently yet to to really have the vol volunteer groups at the heart of how uh, outcomes are being uh, accomplished. Um, and I, I, I think it, it's it would really be worth worth our while looking at at how joined up we are with our interfaces um, and also you know whether all the different volunteer groups are operating disparately or whether there's there's some additional connectivity that we can make between them so we get some efficiency of, of, of fundraising obviously but also resources in in terms of the delivery of the particular priorities <laughs> that we want to emphasize as part of uh, as part of the council plan so um so i'd, I'd leave that as an open question about whether we need to be investing some time in thinking critically about the support for volunteers, how we judge whether that support is adequate, whether we need some more effort in that area. Thank you, and Councillor Mohan, please. Um, <clears throat> it's a suggestion which I made at the time of the visit, uh, particularly in relation to Acton playing fields. Um, there's a lot of activity and work going on, which uh, I think uh, probably not uh, everybody in the borough knows about it. I think uh, there is room for more publicity of these activities so that uh, people can know about it and they, if they want to get involved, uh, so they can do that. Thank you. 
Yes, indeed. Yeah, I think we're talking about the bite-sized publicity. So maybe it's something that we could do, even you know, even through the council Twitter account. Is just occasionally send out tweets about particular one particular project that's going on. Just say, well, look, here's artification over in North Acton. Get involved. Um, here's Horsenden Farm. You know that what they're doing. Let's get involved. You know, it may be maybe it is true. Maybe we need to be far more supportive. So that can be a recommendation that we need to be very supportive. Of it. Councillor Taylor, please. Uh yeah, I was going to ask this earlier, actually, and it's not meant as criticism, but thinking about engagement um, and thinking about demographics of people who might get involved, and, and um, clearly I don't, but <laughs> but I'm just trying to think what, I mean, the last visit, I think, you had uh, Amajit Singh, I think, what's the name? Um, so it's the first person I've, I wasn't on that bit of the visit, unfortunately, so I just wondered what kind of engagement we're thinking about local communities as well, or was it? Do I say predominantly white engagement? <laughs> what you know, who who sort of gets involved at the moment? How can we reach out more? Really? Yeah, um, that's something that we've always struggled with in our, in our membership is that we do have predominantly white middle class people interested in nature, interested in green spaces, getting involved. Um, recently, we've had a, a big strategy meeting and, and put diversity and inclusion um, strategy into what we're doing, and we are recruiting very shortly for. Um, diversity and inclusion officer at Ealing Wildlife Group. Um, one of the things that was coming up, um, talking about Acton there prior, is we have limited time and resource um, to kind of achieve our goals and objectives. And we've tried, um, we do try to tr cover the whole borough and we try and focus sometimes on doing more of our kind of outreach activities in the likes of Acton, North Old, South Old. Um, unfortunately, we get less engagement in those areas. Um, and being focused on both community and wildlife conservation, mm -hmm. we have to try and spread our limited time and resources on achieving results as well. So I would love to have the time, resource and capable volunteers and leaders of, of talks and walks and things to be able to deliver um, in those kind of areas where there's less engagement with green space. But it's a balance between also working full time and doing this in a spare time and, and trying to also achieve the conservation element of what we do. So yeah, the more resource we can get on that, the better, but we are working on it and we recognize there's an issue there. Yes, please. No, I take your point. I think, I mean, as a point I raised in the last meeting, because I think those areas, particularly in Hackton, we have a high level of private renting as well. So that may impact people's tendencies to get involved because they're, they're not long-term stays. But um, I was thinking of when you mentioned walks, actually, because there is somebody around North Acton who does a lot of walks programs, especially around Park Rural. And I'm going to talk to her later in the year as well about other areas as well. You know, perhaps it's worth linking up. She may not be interested, don't get me wrong, but she normally does history walks of buildings and things, but it might be something, you know, as a, as a get together. So. Yes, please, Chris. You can't just expect diverse populations to get involved got to build a community of practice we've got to get them behind a common goal and that takes time and energy uh, the canal and rivers trust uh, grants 700,000 match funded by the council 350,000 is a million pound scheme involving canal and green spaces we uh, we've created a social movement in Southall let's go Southall we brought 45 people to the consultation event 45 of them were from diverse backgrounds uh, and that's because they're they're supporting a common cause and that community of practice. We're now using that group of people, that expanded group of people, to consult on all sorts of things. And they have actually recently led an active travel survey across the borough. So uh, you have to you have to do something different in order to create those communities to get interested and get involved. And we're now working with them around development, planning issues, physical activity. And of course, nature, nature, and nature conservation, nutrition, etc., is is following that lead. Uh, but it takes enormous time and energy, and we're lucky to have some finance to invest in that program. Sir One one thing that we did see. I mean, you, you it was a shame that you weren't there actually at, at Bixley. But one of the things that we were talking about on the site was the the perimeter to the site and the rewilding of it and maybe a more active use of, uh, of Bixley Field in the adjacent area. Um, but what was really interesting was how much energy there was from the folk who were there 
um, to those uh, efforts. And, and so that definitely, so it's, I think, I don't think it's lack of interest. Um, I think it's some, it's somehow getting, drawing people in who perhaps don't come in, wouldn't come in through the, through the, the natural routes. Um, but, you know, I came away from that with half a dozen people who seem really interested and up for uh, a kind of rewilding campaign, something very active um, in, in that area, which, which I think kind of led me to, to, to think, you know, maybe we need to be, to be uh, headhunting almost, you know, targeting people who we can see have got passion and drawing them more into things, not just in, the, in their own neighbourhoods, but maybe kind of around um, around the borough as well. And, and maybe that then starts to act as a bit of an encouragement for other folk um, to get involved as well. But uh, you know, I was, I was really encouraged by the by the energy and passion that people were showing for the change in that area. Um, so, so the question is, is for me, is more about accessing people to to help them feel empowered to to get involved. Yes, I will echo that. I mean, basically, I mean, that was one thing that they kept mentioning was a, a halo effect, that it'd be a, a case of once you've been working in that that small place within the allotments, maybe it'll have, um, maybe it'll just grow and all in terms of the community interest and community involvement. And it would, um, for example, there's one thing that we that we talked a bit about was the security um, and the potential for antisocial behaviour in, in the area. But of course, as things um, actually get 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 better there and as things we you know it really expand and thrive then then maybe it does have some kind of very positive effect on on how people respect the place and how people behave i mean so so that to me i mean maybe one thing out of the recommendations is that there's a whole list of things that the people there um at St. bixley um were suggesting to us that it does give us some kind of um, some kind of encouragement that despite the lack of resources to see what we can do in order to help these places get you know become become great allotment sites that are just real kind of magnets for the community um i mean the kind of things that were coming up um was that maybe that we need to um properly enforce the plots to, to ensure the plot holders are managing their their allotments as they should be um and we should also need to deal, deal with the break in communications and improve coordination so that we know about where there are empty plots and then match them up with people who are on the waiting list uh, because there are people who have been waiting a very long time. Um, and as well mentioned about security, that maybe we can help to improve security because there were a number of allotment sites that were broken into a few weeks ago. So maybe we need to ensure that kind of thing doesn't necessarily happen so much in the future. Um, we can put improvements into the pathways in order to improve access. Um, and this will also help make it safer to invite school children um, in so they can learn about growing and actually learn where fruit and vegetables come from, especially, you know, especially those who don't necessarily have gardens of their own, um, and also get the community more involved as, as a whole. And uh, one, one other thing they were asking about in order to, to give the, the allotments a little bit more relevance all year round was looking at um, a communal polytunnel for winter growth with geothermic heating systems. So maybe that's something that, that might be of interest, but uh, uh, to let's look into if it is at all possible. Um, maybe clearer demarcation of particular plots in order, uh, in order to improve harmony between different plot holders. Um, and uh, we've also um, already kind of looked at um, the, the surrounding areas and introducing more pollinators, which would have a great benefit to the to the site itself. And also looking more at um, bringing in wood chips, compost, and manure um, in, in, into the site in order to help, especially since wood chips help to to keep um, keep the ground warm. And uh, we already mentioned about the, the about the kind of the, the wish for associations. I think Chris Welsh mentioned that about that earlier. That um, maybe we can have those forums where people can get together and discuss, and even like a biannual, triannual, whatever ne whatever necessary basis, in order to discuss the matters that we need to look at. So, so, I mean, so it's going to turn that could potentially turn into a, like a very big recommendation of like these are the kind of things that we need to see what we can look at and then maybe officers can of course give their opinions. I, I, so I would like to intervene at that point uh, yes I would really not want to see a long list of recommendations for allotments per se there's 44 a lot 45 allotment sites two and a half thousand tenants we went to a site that need support not all of the sites need support and we're working very actively with the Ealing allotment partnership uh, in terms of most of the things you've you've referenced there, we recognise there's some issues. We recognise there's been a, a drain on resources to support the allotments communities. Um, 
that's too much of a, a blank that's too much of a that's too much of a blanket response across the whole allotment um community where we're identifying where there are key issues because a lot of that already happens and we could have taken you to a high flying site where you wouldn't have heard any of any of that uh very happy for paul, paul to come in on that point but i just just a note of caution because actually there are some huge positives in healing going on around around allotments and what i don't want us to portray is just the negative stuff there are indeed yes so councillor susan also i think can i ask a question is someone in charge of just allotments in the council or not they used to be they were made redundant in 2015 when the council's park service had to find savings of 1.5 million 1.5 million pounds taken out of the park's budget 62 percent cut in budget mm. we have no capital budget we are reliant on s106 so when you talk about geothermal heating of pony tunnels i'm thinking wouldn't it be lovely <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 so, <laughs> yes, I know there's some people on, on their allotment sites maybe have their own poly tunnels which they uh, which they which they run. And so um I mean maybe it's a case of in terms of recommendations, then maybe we just look at the idea of having some kind of the associations, as Chris mentioned, having the forum, having the ability for people to actually get together and to and to just look at what can be achieved for themselves, because that is a whole point of it, is in order to get the community cooperating together. Um I know that um yeah, that, 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 that Dr. McCormack earlier was saying about conservation, collaboration, and community, and that is those kind of. I mean, those are the kind of values that we want to bring into this. And so, actually, it, what we can do to support those forums where allotments can work together, and then, and then, fix it can become as strong as maybe some of the other allotments that maybe are, that are, that we're aware of in Ealing. But and, it, and, it, and it will be. We recognise the energy that we saw there on Saturday, and, and I'm yes. really hopeful. Uh, well, that's got a really good future future story, uh, but it will need support. Um, and I had a few challenging conversations with some of the tenants on that site and says, who the council don't do anything, they never come, they don't do this, they don't do that. And actually, I said to them, well, Chris Welsh is the parks manager, he's got 147 parks, five cemeteries, 84 playgrounds, blah, 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 blah. you know, 80,000 trees, etc. I can't afford him to be here dealing with tenant issues around somebody stealing something out of a shed but sadly we we do because there isn't anybody else but working with the allotments partnership in those communities and being highlighted where there are issues and we can focus some some energy in, in, in attention a lot of the issues have arisen from a lacking in business support and administration support and things have got away at certain sites and we want to make sure we recover that so at the moment it, it is a hot topic uh, in terms of recommendations, one of the best phrases I've heard here tonight was Sean saying shovel ready. Because actually the way the funding system works in this country is that you get very short windows to apply for, for funding. Uh, and if we, we used to do this more than we do now, again, because of a lack of resources, we used to have things on the shelf. The canal and rivers towpath was a, was a feasibility and a technical study that sat on the shelf for, for literally a month because then suddenly the Mayor of London announced a significant funding stream. If we had 10, 20, 30 shovel-ready schemes that we know we've, we've co-designed with community organisations, then we're very likely to be more successful in generating more external funding into the authority at a time when we haven't got the internal funding to support our ambition. So for me, one of the key recommendations is working to deliver a, a, a programme of shovel-ready projects and we used to use that term a number of years ago and it's dropped off our vocabulary that sounds like a yeah, good, yeah, good, good way of looking at it i just i did want to just raise the issues that were there because that's part of the point of us going out there and just to, and, and just to see what we could very happy to for help. paul to come in yes yeah, so so. i would very much love um, mr carter to come in with his um allotments expertise um i wasn't particularly going to talk about allotments but um but one thing that you said there, Chris, I, I, I do want to emphasise, which is, and again, it goes back to that point I made about uh, probably a, a, the, the changing nature of the contact between council and the volunteer groups. And I think the big prize there is, is fundraising, actually. Um, so we, we're talking about the polytunnels and the geothermic um, uh, base structure for those. I mean, there is a plan for that across uh, a number of sites in Ealing. Uh, all funded uh through uh through through fund through funders 
Um, so no call on the on the on the council for that. But it's a really interesting idea, and it, and um, and again, actually, just um, uh, kind of referencing back to Councillor Taylor's point earlier, that would be a really good role model. That you know, if we can start to roll out uh, those sorts of um, assets around different parts of the borough, then it creates projects. Um, which then act as kind of role models for for things around the borough, and, and hopefully then draws in a more diverse set of people to to participate. But I think fundraising for me is the is the kind of principal big win that we can make that we can get out of uh, that closer cooperation. Um, and the more that the council is able to spec out the things where. Um, where there'll be some some real advantage in terms of of our of our plan, the, the easier it's going to be then to to get the um, the volunteer groups to be able to uh, organise themselves behind the fundraising and then delivery of those. So that that I think is the, is the, is the kind of big prize. But there I think there are some spin off benefits too. Yes, that does actually make a lot of sense to me. It's like because we're going back to what we mentioned earlier about the Ealing Parks Foundation. I mean the real. Uh, the real, I mean, the foundations of that are in the fact that we have lost so much money from our parks budget. We haven't got that that money there anymore. So it's about really empowering people to have friends groups to look after parks and green spaces and to look at what we can be done about the fundraising. And so maybe we are then expanding into the idea of instead of just looking at friends of parks, it's like friends of allotments. And, uh, and I do love the idea of having maybe some of the allotments that, that, that have been a little bit more successful in the management in that in those issues that i raise um it, just to maybe see see what we can learn from them um because because there's one particular allotment site that i'm aware of that's, i don't want to actually mention names i don't want to just pit one up against the other but then there's one particular site that's, that's um that's, that i did actually get to visit because i because i know someone who's very much involved in that site and and uh, you know i just was like wow things some of the things that are going on there so maybe there is a great example to follow so that's something that we can look at i mean if we do look at the idea of if if we, if we even if we can't necessarily have what um, Councillor Zizimov was talking about, the um, having that officer who was looking up who's particularly charged with looking after allotments, that if there is some way of coordinating it, so there is some kind of leadership going on there somewhere. Um, Councillor Taylor, please. Perhaps the suggestion would be uh, a recommendation: just identify mechanisms, share good practice. I think you know, just leave it on there rather than get into the specifics, and then people can go away and find out what's possible really i think leave it on that level and then actually um let them get on with it at the same time i'm trying to think of the best way of actually putting together these recommendations in terms of i don't know if we're going to have it word perfect at the end of the evening we've got a few minutes to to sit and confer and to discuss and to argue over particular wording so um would it be best if it's something we just uh maybe try and put wording together and and then get it fully we agreed at the next meeting or something would that be i think in terms of allotments i think i would be very happy for all and officers to to finesse some recommendations out of this um as opposed to a service re review of allotments and actually identify some wins in relation to it, the, the topic around rewilding or regrowing as opposed to the, the management of it because i think that's a distraction um and the, the, the bigger prize is around fundraising too um when we when we made massive cuts into the budget the challenge was to create an army of volunteers to replace the resource that the council was taking out i sit back and say job done thank you <laughs> well it brings with I'm, I'm being facetious but it brings with it other challenges in terms of expect managing expectation and managing those relationships and we are now largely relationship managers we are indeed. So, um, okay. So, try and look at what ideas we've got for the recommendations. Maybe it is something we need to go away with and, and then just put particular wording in place. So, looking at what Councillor Crawford was talking about the local plan, I mean, that's something that's, that's very important. So, um, look, we've been looking at diversity and inclusion and officer help. So, maybe we're we're looking at that. Maybe this is all coming together in that one big recommendation in terms of how we're helping people within the within you know. Um, Within the allotment community, in order to to work together and to and to get the resources they need, um, so that maybe come together in one. So I guess that's that's two recommendations. There, I've also been looking at trying getting more 
publicity out there about what's going on. So that's really kind of three recommendations. Um, I'm trying to really think what else um, came out of what we really what we did really on Saturday, for example. Um, I think that probably pretty much covers what what was there. I mean, there was one point that I just um, made when we went to Greenford to Gurnell was just seeing if we could do more to um, help Green um, Greenwayers get the um, get more corporate support in terms of people actually going out there helping them to pick the litter um, as part of kind of corporate projects, a bit of corporate volunteering. So, I mean, that was did that be a, another part? Can, of I, that? can I bring Chris in in terms of just giving you a very perhaps a one minute overview in terms of what we already do. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, with regards to corporate, we so the range of service um, already do engage with corporate volunteering and, and some of it through our existing partners, such as Trees for Cities, uh, TCV, uh, and other organizations um, that, that come in. But we do actually have our own um, brochure that, that we've been out and cold called local companies uh, over the past few years, um, but that that engagement that we've been doing with friends, in fact, uh, Orson and Hill, um, and the Greenware is having having just sort of secured their their first group. Um, were we as a service are now sort of working in tandem with with friends groups um, to help us enable um, uh, you know corporate corporate groups because some of them can be dozens dozens and dozens, you know, up to 50, 60, 70, 70 different staff coming at the same time. And with, with a reduced uh, range or complement, um, and I, I know Sean talked about the, the existing short-term loss, which we, we will be replacing, but the ranger provision used to be in its thirties um, a decade ago, whereas at the moment at, at full complement, we only have seven. Um, so that, that skills knowledge for us to be able to, to manage corporate volunteers at, at a large scale um, is not attainable for us as a service. So we have to work in partnership with um, very skilled and talented uh, volunteers that can help us um, engage with those corporate um, members uh, of the community and beyond uh, in order to help achieve um, many of the targets that are in, in the BAP and beyond really. Okay, well, that's, I mean, that, that just sounds fine if it's, if it's, if it's slightly more difficult. For, uh, but I think, that's, I think when it comes down to the corporate volunteering, maybe it's something that uh, maybe organisations themselves need to be very good at actually just being able to look, a bit, look for opportunities for their staff members to get involved with. But I mean, it's always helpful, the fact that if we are publicising what's going on with green, green wires, for example, through, um, through our kind of council communication channels to residents and that kind of thing is going to feed through to organisations as well. So but that may well be quite helpful. Uh, yeah. Oh, th thank you, Ms. Council Taylor. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about that. I know because a lot of corporate, what was it called? Corporate social responsibility, wasn't it? I think. Um, and that stopped you obviously during the pandemic. But I mean, and a lot of the organizations do it because they want to build their teams and morale, doesn't it? And it's often about what I guess for the teams, it's like actually, I think what Chris might be getting at is they want someone something that comes along that's going to be effective for them as opposed to just the organization if, if it's just a day out so it, it's trying to kind of match up the two really isn't it so, it's the management of yeah. of corporate social days uh when we had a dedicated park manager at walpole park and the same goes for gunnersbury manager we could engineer that to have massive corporate days once or twice a week uh recently we had 200 employees of an organization at horson and hill at gunnersbury park some of the organizations on the golden mile dell gsk they got into a habit where actually their staff were popping down at lunchtime to do some volunteering because there was somebody who could direct them because they were static on the site come in tomorrow do that but well, that you know we haven't got park managers in any of our parks any longer so it's about volunteer management you can't just let your volunteers run well no that's true you can't yeah we we get emails all the time asking can we come and volunteer at Costons Lane Nature Reserve can we come and do some conservation work and the issue is one of us has to take a day off work to coordinate that and to lead that it's just not sustainable um, unless we have a paid position volunteer manager um, to to be able to compensate for that time so yeah we'd love to get more done against the bat 
by using corporate volunteers, but they need management. So I guess it's something for those, those charities that are actually working anyway, they've got paid, paid employees that are managing volunteers. That's the kind of thing that maybe, maybe one of the recommendations without putting words into the panel's mouth is that when SIL becomes available in 2024, that there is a request that there is a volunteer management resource created to support the work of the council and, and community organisations. Perhaps, Chair. I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so that gives us a bit more, another kind of reason to to, to justify our, when, when we do um, kind of talk to developers as well. Uh, yes. So, it was there someone else? Oh, Councillor Meadie, please. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that a lot of um, big organisations they do um, organise cleanups in the area, but I think they don't speak to the council about it. Maybe so. Um, I know. Um, during, I think it was June or July, um, Shiva's brothers, they had a big um, group of their staff come along and I think it was about 30 to 40 people. And we went to an allotment um, clean out in Hanwell. So um, there are big organizations that do it, like McDonald's do it and they do it with Lager Can. So um, yeah, but they just don't need to um, speak to the council or take up count officers time to organize, but yeah. Right, okay. So um, just on that point, okay. Okay. we absolutely embrace Lager Can and the work that they do, and, and they're creating little sub organizations. And Chris referenced Curb. We, it's an investment. We, we literally bend over backwards to help the, the involvement of Lager Can because it's that army of volunteers that we need. Um, what I'm really interested in is the is almost the human behaviour and the science behind the benevolence of people to give up their time to do council work. It's brilliant. And as I say, we you know what I would like to see is some sort of reward mechanism for the time and effort that our residents are giving to to their communities uh, and creating that pride in where they live. Um, I mean, they've been they've they've won the Queen's Award, you know. Uh, for voluntary services, but you know, some, some, somehow, some mechanism to recognise the incredible resource that has been created out of that organisation, and it's spreading. You know, it's creating pockets of other organisations. And Kathy from from um, Live Cam was actually in a meeting at McDonald's last week in terms of how they can work together to you know increase their their stretch, their reach. So, um, yeah there's a there's a challenge i said we'd plant a tree for every 200 bags of litter they created as a you know they never really i thought they'd bite me arm off but they haven't it's phenomenal okay the last council says please. Right, um, so you think that you should get a staff member for what was that again you said We've created an army of volunteers, 5,000 with with Ealing Wildlife Group, 3,000 members of Lager Can. You know, you're probably getting up to 10,000 people in this borough. So All of that needs management, right. so engagement, direction and guidance and support. So the ready, um, what was it, that for the funding, that you need funding for the funding. So getting a person that will be in charge of applying for funding could pay for themselves and get money for the council? Yes, no? Uh, you can argue it any way you like. Council used to have a funding officer, uh, but they used to work across bigger priorities than parks, for example. Um, we often lean in the direction of funding. So often we will do things because there's funding and not necessarily aligned to our priorities. And if, if you have one funding officer, Everyone goes, it's their job. At the moment, we've got loads of people making funding applications. So it's spread across a more broader remit. That's, that's the challenge. If you have one person just doing funding applications, then nobody else does it because it becomes one person's job. So, so there's a risk there. For me, it was around coordination, management, engagement, consultation, and just support, not necessarily around that funding applications. Okay. Um, 
So another question is that if you had in the magic world where there's a magic money tree and you could get a second person to help you, what would that be? In the you, park service. You can go on and on, to be nice to me. Sean would very much like us to have an ecologist on board. Uh, you know, our tree team is under-resourced. Our technical manage our project management team is under-resourced, so we're late delivering capital programs and projects, S106, etc. We have no allotments manager. We have no contract manager with the relationship with GEL. Um, it goes on and on. Uh, we have no distinct planning consultant, so we've got some very expert landscape architects that do that for us. We do an incredible amount with very, with very little, and I think that's recognised. Um, but that becomes wearing, and at the moment, and Paul's enlightened to this, we've lost a bit of faith and trust with our allotment communities in some, some allotments across the borough because the council's resources have got to a position where actually they can't handle the amount of work that's required. So it's tough, it is tough. I'm not denying it, it's quite stressful out here at the moment. Um, we've had some quite positive conversations around growth, um, but now we're looking at a, a significant budget gap for 2023-24, and we're being asked to look at a realm of savings again. Sadly, parks and open spaces have been an easy target, and we've delivered those over the years, and I keep coming back for more. So, as I say, we have no capital budget. I don't know if that resonates with people, what that means. If you've got a broken piece of piece of play equipment in your board, and your resident says, the slide's broken, or this outdoor bit of gym's broken, there's no money to do anything to that unless there's S106 funding. And as you know, the S106 funding isn't across the borough, it's in pockets of the borough. So we have to say, we've never said no so often over the last three years, as we're saying now. And councillors don't understand that because you want to, you know, they're your constituents and you want to satisfy them. And we're turning around to you and saying, sorry, can't do that. Well, we even asked about the sign and the allotment thing that was like really horrible. And, mm -hmm. and Chris Walsh said, we've got 20, was it 20,000 pounds or something? worth of signs that we need to replace. So, yeah, you're going to get replaced. Mr. Carter. Well, I mean, just it just reinforces the, the, the point that we keep making, I think, that the, the future is in the is in our volunteers. Um, and and I and I and I do think it's worth an investment in time in thinking about how volunteers work together. Um, because with fundraising, for example, a lot of fundraising comes out of having good relationships with the with the big funders. Now you don't want that to be spread across 500 different people. You want a few people who've got really good relationships and and they kind of operate on behalf of of kind of wider groups. But there just needs to be a bit more coordination. So this this idea of a volunteer management, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't see them having that fundraising expertise, but I think value will come out of them being able to facilitate efficient applications for funding. Um, and then that, that then starts to backfill, um, you know, all the kind of gaps which, you know, Chris has been talking about that we've seen over the last few years. Vanessa, two or three times tonight, she was the closest we ever, we ever got to that. Um, but she was managing a team of staff and, and drafting the BAP on top of all of that other community engagement. So having a distinct person to do that, it's not the panacea to everything, but it's it's, a, it's certainly better than we've got. Um, I guess. Um, so, uh, Councilor Taylor. Yeah, Chair. I mean, this has made me feel guilty. I've been in cabinet with putting these cuts through now. You know, all those years ago. So thank you very much. Um, I don't want us to put down a recommendation that's going to be kicked back straight away because if we make a spending commitment, and I think we're going to need to look for word that's actually going to help us uh, grow that um, back. If you like, sorry, it's you know about what you know what things we, that could be looked for investment without actually specifying this is this is the person we need. So maybe just come up with some wording uh, around that so it's not kicked back straight away. So, I think I've batteries run out of mine. You can sell that as a massive positive in terms of what's happened over the last five years in terms of the the army of volunteers that have been born out of austerity and COVID and Brexit and all of that, and actually just say, this now needs to be recognised, A, and B, supported. 
because as quickly as it's formed, as quickly as it could fall over. And I know that. I, the let's go south, and I'm sorry if I bore you over this over the next few years, but it's a it's a personal project of mine, and I call it fragile because it would only take one external intervention, and it could all fall over tomorrow. And I don't know what that is, and I'm looking out for it. But the same could be said of all of our community relationships. If I turn around to Sean and said, no beavers, no money, he's going to go, well, actually, I'm going to pull up the drawbridge and we're not going to work with you anymore. And suddenly we've lost all that support and good good faith that's been built up over the years. And the same goes for the Allotments Partnership, the Eating Parts Foundation, Larga Can. Don't believe Larga Can. I'm not beating on our door saying, we want more, we want more, we want more support. And we're going, yeah, well, okay, okay, we're trying to meet that expectation. Uh, and largely we do, but you know, Kathy gives us a really hard time to make sure that we're delivering. Uh, and is becoming a, a critical friend in terms of saying, that's broken, that's broken. I really think you should fix that. Why don't you do that? And, and to us, that's great intelligence, but actually sometimes we're going, sorry, we just can't do that. But as I say, there is, a, there is something to be born out of a, of a really positive message to take back and say. Um, Paul won't know this, but previous scrutiny panel was was looking at active citizen, citizenship across the council uh, not that many years ago, uh, which again was born out of the active citizen program that was going on across the council, even down to people that were standing on the roads measuring car speeds as, as part of the traffic management program, they were volunteers. Good Jim came in, uh, et cetera. So to say, it might be worth digging out the recommendations from that panel work to see whether those have been taken up seriously and, in, and, and put in place. Because dare I say, they probably haven't, probably, probably sitting there um, without any support. So, okay, so I'm, yeah, I'd say we've got a lot, a lot, a lot that we've been talking about, and it's a question of really wording it in a way that it's going to be acceptable to us all. So uh, do you think it's just the best thing then if maybe yourself, maybe Chris, and maybe one to other people, but just um, put together the wording in terms of what we're doing in terms of covering the office, what officer help, diversity and inclusion, SIL, rewards program, volunteering manager, and just finding a way of, of putting together that into one, into one tidy uh, um, paragraph, which of course you will find acceptable at the end of it, you know, so at least then we don't end up with it instantly being rejected. But yeah, so as I say, there's no way we're going to be able to sit here and, and, and put every single word together on that one. Um, and so, but I mean, also we wanted to put together a recommendation. And um, so what we want to do is to have the council utilise all its communication channels in order to put out bite size and information about all the organizations that we've been discussing and the opportunities that are there to help and actually get them interested in helping. So we can find a way of um, wording that. Um, I don't think there's anything too controversial there. So maybe I could even try and put something together and hopefully we can maybe just um yeah just give yeah just um put that through the next meeting perhaps. Um and also what um Councillor Crawford was saying about the local plan. Um, I don't know if there's any particular wording you would like on that, Councillor Crawford, or if, or if that's something we could. Okay, that might be it. Maybe that'd be an idea then, because there's plenty of time. But yeah, it's just a just if you want to put together some wording that we can, as a, yeah, again, we could just finalise the next meeting. That might be the best thing to do. Because, yeah, otherwise, yeah, because that is actually a very, very much a hot topic as well, and so it's very much in our minds. So we'll bring it into what works with everything else that we've got going on in terms of wide wide consultation on the local plan. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to consultation local plan, the, there was a discussion the other night um, with councillors, and I think everyone realised that the consultation process, it, it's not very good. I mean, it's getting out, and the very people that your membership, those people who see the value of, in, of, of in, in, you know, engagement, then um, they might actually respond. And we might, and, 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 and rather than the predictable, I mean, just having, you know, just, you know, for, for the plan, where we consult. They're talking about consulting in, in, in libraries. I mean, that's great. How many libraries do we have? And how far are they? How difficult are they to get to? 
um, on on a November December evening or, or whatever. So so it's if 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 the officers can work on the what they know about you know um, with you know volunteers. And 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 dif dif different organisations, including working on the, those volunteers during the pandemic. I mean, they're very. I mean, you know, lots of them are actually members members of your organisation anyway. So it's it's just what it, it's trying to think of it. You know, what more can we do? Do, and I was just wondering the um, with the round dealing. Maybe we should be looking at a volunteers page. Um, so you know, people reporting and saying what 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 is being done, and lots of different you know areas of, of, of within our community. But I think people would love to hear more about you know the, the you know your 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 organisation, and understanding that well there might be get enough volunteers. Um, in, in in a particular area, there may be just small things that a group can do um, w without the parks having the burden of of, of you know that organisation. So, chair, can I come in on on the first point? Sorry to elongate the meeting. I think there's a real risk of us getting lost in the local plan, which is probably the most influential plan that the council will see over the next 10 to 20 years. And it's a it's a machinery all of its own. And I think it's bigger than this panel. I think the panel needs to reflect back on the rewild, regrow element of the planning system to see how that can be promoted through the planning system as opposed to the local plans a beast. And we won't make any dent in that, I don't believe, through the work of this panel. But as I say, trying to find somebody in the planning system here around rewilding and regrowing and how that can be promoted amongst the development community would, would probably be where I would I would put the energy. But you're not wrong, Councillor Crawford, but I just think it's this is a difficult one because we are really encouraged to reach out and in, ensure the consultation for local plan. We're not just going to be talking to residents, we can be reaching out to to other stakeholders as well. And I think that's that's something that we're being actively encouraged. So maybe it is uh, I mean, maybe we've just find a way of just wording something that that we that, that might be acceptable and may well be just might, that, that officers might find is acceptable in terms of what your thoughts were on the local plan, because I do think. I mean, surely, because of the way that we've been encouraged to find find people's views and to ensure that we do represent everybody. Um, one, one thing that's just been suggested to me is um, that we're looking at what's going to be like, look, uh, what, what we've done in the past with board forums. I mean, what's going to come in is place and what we can do through that in order to encourage people to have some kind of input. But, uh, um, but then um, in terms of knowing about events that are going on and what's going on in their community as well. Um, but so I think, but I would, yeah, I would still invite Councillor Corver to, to see if you do want to word something along around the local plan, bearing in mind the feedback that we've had. Yes. I think this, it might be a, just, you know, a small step, but I think there is a correlation with what we're talking about and the built environment of, of how we can go one step further. So I'll, look, I'll leave it with the officer, uh, and then we, we we can fine tune it at the next meeting. Well, that sounds that sounds that sounds good to me. If um, so, is that something that we're looking at uh, Chris Bunting doing, or is someone else looking at? Or okay, right, yeah, that's the thing. Yes, so that's that's yes. yes. Okay, we'll look, we'll sit, oh, we'll ask them about planning. We'll see if they can can help me perhaps put together something on that one. Yeah, so that that's something we'll do. Um, yeah, um, there's, there's no further input on that. Okay, so in that case, oh, okay, thank you. No, it wasn't a recommendation, sorry. just just sorry, practicality, because I think the idea this week, so as I understood it, we make the recommendations and we're not waiting for the end of the year report, we're actually moving these on quite quickly um, as the process. So obviously, Councillor Crawford has talked about local plan relationship example. We're not, you know, in years gone past, it was the end of the year report, recommendations, go to cabinet six months later, yes or no sort of thing. But actually, 
the idea has been live recommendations. So our next meeting is in January, I think. Was January, it? yes, yes. Yeah, so so um, it's probably not too far away, but it's it's about moving that on. And if you do, you know, without mentioning specific posts that Chris and his team might want, we might end up missing the budget <laughs> budget cycle as well at some point. Um, so we have to be mindful about what we're trying to push forward quite quite quickly as well. So. Um, okay, so is there like a, I'm trying to remember actually what you originally mentioned, uh, Council Crawford, when you originally made the point about local plan. I'm trying to remember exactly what the. Okay, if it's, if that's something that's okay, if it's going to be, if it's going to make things difficult, well, that's fine. Yeah, it doesn't so, mean it has to be done tonight. I mean, just it's a lot yeah. quicker than before January. Yeah, so it means we need a mechanism then if if yeah. uh, matters, but uh, if, I mean, what what can be agreed to be done before then. So. I'm um, certainly. I mean, looking at looking at the what was mentioned before about about looking at the volunteer manager and that and that kind of encompassing recommendation. That's something that we that we can be probably agreed outside of this meeting. I would if people would would be happy with that. Okay, that's something I think it's pretty much agreed then that we can agree that. And then, um, okay, that's fine. And we'll also I'll look at what we're doing about the communications. Yes. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for your patience, everybody. And I think we've come to some good conclusions there. Um, yes, yeah, so as you say, yes, we've got the next meetings. I mean, nineteenth of January, um, looking at trees, and um, then we'll also maybe have on um, discussions online or, or or by email or whatever about what we might do.